Hi, and welcome to Finding Your Way Through Therapy, a proud member of the Sightcraft Network. The goal of this podcast is to demystify therapy, what can happen in therapy, and the wide array of conversations you can have in and about therapy. Through personal experiences, guests will talk about therapy, their experiences with it, and how psychology and therapy are present in many places in their lives, with lots of authenticity and a touch of humor. Here is your host, Steve Bisson. Alors, vous êtes un ange, you are an angel, and thank you, and welcome to episode 142. If you haven't listened to episode 141 yet, please do so. It is with Catherine Darley. We talked about sleep, and it was a great episode. I've certainly used some of the tricks already, so I hope you go and listen to that. But episode 142 will be with Laura Long. Laura Long someone I met from a different podcast I was on, and she's a licensed marriage and family therapist based out of Greenville, South Carolina. In addition to her private practice, Laura also provides coaching, consultation, and mentorship to mental health therapists, helping them gain confidence in their practice and other entrepreneurial pursuits. I think we're going to talk about that. She offers online masterminds, in-person retreats, and conducts workshops for therapists who are ready to do the damn thing. I also know that Laura is a real person, and um, I can't wait for you guys to hear more uh, from her. So here is the interview. Hey there, everyone. Uh, you've known me to host this podcast for about 130 something episodes before I put actually any type of commercials on here. And I'm looking right now at my healthcare professionals looking to have a real impact with our clients. I, I really enjoyed this product and I've actually used it personally. And that is why, which is very important for me to tell you because that's why I want to share this. I want to introduce Freed, F R E E D, Freed the app that listens, transcribes, writes your medical documentation for you. With Freed, you actually can actually pay attention to your clients, do things with your clients, and not be distracted by making sure you're writing notes. What also helps with this app is that the note is saved for about 10 days, and it does disappear, no longer is there after a while. So writing down those notes is no longer your responsibility. The AI Freed will write the note for you and create a progress note for you. But it goes also beyond that. And what I really like about it is that it can help you set goals and it even creates a letter. You can make any type of edit to it and there's actually a button now for it to learn how you write your own notes. So maybe the first few days you set it up so that your Freed can recognize your note taking process and how you want to create a progress note, either soap or what have you. And it really helps you with that. And the best part, it's very affordable. I really think that at $99 a month, you'll have access to what helps your practice. And I'll tell you, I can tell you from personal experience, taking notes, writing down notes, writing down the goals, writing down any type of letter a client might need, that usually takes me, you know, I don't know, it takes me a lot of time during a week. Maybe I used to do my notes on Sunday and it used to take me about three hours. Now, I think that if it takes me an hour, that's surprising. And when you think about freed.ai, it's very affordable. Uh, For just $99 a month, you can access everything that I just talked about. If you pay for the whole year, you actually save 10%, which is what I did. And I'm looking forward to continuing to use it. And because you hear this podcast, you're my friend, someone I know, I have a little treat for you. You can use the code Steve50, again, Steve, S-T-E-V-E, 50, and you'll get $50 off your first month. That's right, more value for your money. I don't want you to miss out on how to get your practice going and give yourself a freedom to pay attention to what's important. Why we did this job is to pay attention to the client. So download free today. Don't forget to use my code Steve50 for $50 off the first month. And let's make a difference in our clients' lives and make sure we can pay attention to them. Remember, with Freed, your clients always come first.
Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 142. I'm just excited to have someone who I've been, I've met her before on a different podcast, uh, Scaling Your Therapy Practice with James Marlin. That was a few uh, months ago of, uh, I think it was October 2023. And I loved Laura so much. And now that we did a pre-interview, I love her even more because she's my peeps, basically. Uh, but welcome, Laura Long, to Finding Your Way Through Therapy. Thank you so much for having me, Steve. It only took like four months for us to get this date coordinated. <laughs> Sorry. But, you know, I think that between being a French Canadian Quebecer, uh, now someone from Massachusetts to an American citizen talking to a Long Island Southern Bell, I think we just got all complex around all that stuff. There's a lot going on. <laughs> <laughs> And, th and then we, you know, I'd be like, hey, what are we going to talk about? We're like, man, yeah, we're just going to shoot the shit. So uh, I was very happy to hear that. And that's kind of like the best thing in the world, in my opinion. Yeah, so. we're just kind of freeballing it. Hopefully some value will come out of it in the process. Yeah, I, I always think that people like real conversations. Most people love it because they say like they don't feel like it's a podcast, feel like they're listening into a conversation. It's kind of yeah. weird. Yeah. Little creepers. Yeah, no, like the voyeurism, and we can talk about sex uh, therapy afterwards. Sure, but, have fun. Let's do it. <laughs> uh, I, I'm game. Whatever, whatever I, comes out, Steve. We will, we will go down any rabbit hole. I'm, <laughs> I'm more than happy to go there. Like you said, you know, you, you I told you before we were press record. I said, oh, I'm going to try to get you angry. You're like, good luck. I'm a therapist. I'm like, yeah, find the rabbit hole. I'm not willing to go into. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, I feel like I know you already, but my audience doesn't know you because maybe they didn't listen to James podcast. So how about you tell them a, bit, a little bit about yourself? Sure thing. Well, my name is Laura Long. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist based out of Greenville, South Carolina. And I'm also a business coach for therapists. That's you forgot me. to flick your hair. Um, I'm a Southern Bay. <laughs> that one. <laughs> exactly. Well, we'll, we'll how many it. accents can we do today? I know that's what I think we're going to try to do, but uh, I think that it's, you know, maybe I can ask you, uh, you know, everyone comes into my show, I say, you know, be in therapy, and I don't know if you've ever been in therapy, so I ask you, have you ever been in therapy? I've been in therapy a lot, a <laughs> lot, Steve. Okay, so you want to know the real deal? I'll tell you the I, real I'd deal. Like, I'd like the real deal. That's what I'm going to tell for. you the real deal, because there's a socially desirable answer I could give you, and then there's the real shit that I'm going to give you. So real the real shit, shit is, is like. I have been to probably six or seven therapists in the last 10 years, hmm. and I don't make it past like session four most of the time uh, because I'm not the easiest client. No, I, yeah, I am kind of a pain. I think it's because, I, so my background is, is like entrepreneurial and when you're an entrepreneur, forget the fact that you're a therapist, but when you're an entrepreneur, you care a lot about your customers and the customer experience. That is like the creme de la creme for me, customer experience. And as a therapist, I like to bleed aspects of that into my work with clients. So it's not just about a client finding me on psychology today, calling me and coming in. I want them to have a nice experience. So I've got this nice room and we've got like a drink station and I care a lot about communication and being on time and all these, like what we would call professional issues in therapy. I see them as customer experience. So from the very first time someone learns about me until our final termination slash graduation session, I want them to feel like nurtured and cared for on multiple levels. And when I am the client, I expect the same thing. And then when I don't get it, it's really hard for me to like open up and be vulnerable with someone whose desk has shit all over it or who was late to our first appointment or whose clock is broken. So I'm just, I'm not an easy client in that way. So therefore I have seen a lot of therapists. Unfortunately, I just haven't seen any of them for very long. Well, you know, having standards is not the worst thing in the world. If you ask me. Well, I appreciate that reframe. My standards no, are pretty high. Sense. Yeah. Because I'm like, you know, if someone is perpetually late to their sessions as the therapist, if they're perpetually late or if the communication is lacking or like, I just notice little, little holes in the ship, so to speak. Then I start to question their clinical abilities, which is not necessarily fair, right? Because if someone has 
crap all over their desk or they're running late a couple of times, like, could they still be a great therapist? Absolutely. Right. So I've just, uh, I've yet to really find that. I don't know what I'm looking for. Diamond in the rough. I don't know. I'm going to put on my glasses um, here for the YouTube channel. Well, that could be yeah, there defense, we go. defense mechanisms, Laura. Maybe you can talk yeah, about that a little bit. Yeah, more. let's talk about it. <laughs> um, yeah, so I've had a, a hard go of it. But on the other hand, I also am the person to be like, yeah, I'm a therapist and I'm a real person. I still have real issues too. Uh, I worked with couples for the first like decade of my career. And I would often find myself telling them, hey, just because I'm married and just because I'm a marriage and family therapist doesn't mean that my husband and I don't go at it. I've definitely called him a schmuck once or two times. <laughs> schmuck. Huh? Okay, we're good. The we're New Yorker go, coming out. I was gonna go. We're gonna go with the Yiddish a little bit. That's yeah, perfect. yeah, you schmuck. <laughs> and that's fakakta. But anyway, uh, no, I think that that's a value valid point. By the way, no, I think this is a good place to go because uh, for me, lateness is also something. Like for me, uh, it w I just did a survey. Uh, someone called me right before this, and it was an insurance company that I will remain nameless. And they said, um, how long do, do people wait in your waiting room? Zero to 15 minutes, 15 minutes to 30 minutes, over 30 minutes. I'm like, five minutes is too much for me. Yeah. I get I get upset when I, like, I'm late five minutes for my clients. I text them from my room and go, something's going on. I'll be right with you or whatever. Yeah. But, but what do you consider, like, late? What would I consider late? Yeah. One minute, two minutes? Mm-hmm. Yeah. If my therapist, if my appointment is at noon and my therapist comes out to get me at 1203, I'm not visibly upset. It's just like a, I'm keeping, it's like a little internal data. Like, Hmm, why weren't they ready? I was ready. Right. I'm paying for a 50 minute session. So you just, I lost three minutes of that. We're down to 47 minutes by the time I sit down and get my bearings. Now we're at 45 minutes. So am I paying for a 50 minute session or a 45 minute session? So I, yeah, I guess I have, I have high standards. Well, you know, I worked with the military, still do. Um, and one of the things I learned from the military is if you're five minutes early, you're on time. And if you start on time, you're late. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that I'm perfect by any stretch, but most of the time I'm within the minute of the time that I said I would start my session. Yeah. And I think it shows respect to your client that the, you honor their time just as much as they're honoring their time. Um, yeah. And so a lot of what I do as a therapist stems from experiences that I've had as a client and how I want my clients to feel when they come to therapy. So even sitting in their vantage point, when they sit on the couch, sometimes I'll sit on the couch and be like, okay, what does it feel like and look like to sit here? Do I feel comfortable? What would make it better? And that's client experience, customer experience. Right. And um, I wish that more therapists thought of that. But unfortunately, I, I think a lot of therapists worry. They bring that worry to their practices because they're worried about having more clients or do I have enough clients or do I get off of insurance or like they, there's just a lot of worry that they bring, but they don't focus. And I'm, I know I'm speaking more generally, but I, I don't think they focus enough on the clients that are already coming to see them and how to make their experience of therapy even better. I mean, you bring up those points and I have like seven questions that popped into my head about that. One of the things that I've done is my office looks a little bit like a man cave, as some people have said to me, and I'm fine with that, by the way. That's my choice. I decided to put my personality on the wall the best I can. But Probably attracts a, a very particular type of person, though, who appreciates that. Or doesn't appreciate it and becomes a good source of conversation, honestly. Sure. I yeah. Mean, like, like people like I'm a Montrealer. So uh, I have a lot of Montreal Canadian stuff in the Boston area. And so the Boston Bruins fans don't really like my Canadians, but it becomes a conversation about different things. And I think that there's there's value in that. But the one thing I've always done is I put whenever I put up some stuff, I sit where the clients are typically sitting and then I look at what they're looking at. Mm -hmm. And most of them have access to two windows. They have access to sayings on the walls that are nice and all that. And then they also have one that says, suck it up, buttercup. I don't know if that's common for therapists to think about it, but for me, I, I don't think they're going to run out of clients, are we? I don't think so. I mean, I agree with you, but I mean, yeah. I don't worry about that stuff. I worry about 
if the clients are comfortable or not. And sometimes my clients, I had a client who didn't like my, I, I had a, a blanket and she like, I don't really like this blanket. I said, I don't know, you can bring your own. She bought me a blanket for Christmas. <laughs> she like- and then a couple of other clients like, oh, that's nice. You didn't choose that, did you? And I'm like, thank you. You know, I banter with my clients. I don't know about yeah. you, but I always banter. Absolutely. We're people too. You know, obviously what we talk about can be really serious at times and heavy, but I think it's also important to show that, yeah, we're, we're real people and we can have normal conversations too. I mean, it, it, we talked about rabbit holes, you know, when you're down the rabbit hole, probably not time for banter. Nope. But, you know, like even between like after the the end of the session to like wrap up sessions or to start up a session, I'll start very banter like to have a conversation. I don't know what happens with you, but that really warms up people, in my opinion. Well, and I think part of becoming a therapist or wanting to become one is because you genuinely like talking to people. You know, if you're someone who hates people or doesn't want to talk to people or you just want to be like, like, so um, my husband's a very introverted engineer. And if he never talked to another soul for the rest of his life, he'd probably be perfectly content. Uh, I would hope that the best therapists are ones who genuinely enjoy just talking to people, getting to know people, learning about them, sharing things with them. It's not just about what is our, you know, treatment modality Right. I mean, that's, that's the hard part is that I'm, I'm sick of hearing treatment modalities, you know, like mm-hmm. when they talk niche or not to niche, you know, for me, I'm like, yes, I do work with first responders and majority that includes like ER people. And I work with military, which I enjoy tremendously. But the reason why is that they're people. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I, I, I don't know, I, as my uh, one cop once said to me, so you took all the quote, normal, hum- like adults, and you worked with the hardest motherfuckers you could find. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I love that. But what I notice about your population is that you work with people who in their own lives, they are the heroes and they can never let their guard down. They're the ones who have to have their shit together. If you're working with first responders, you're working with people in the military. They don't have a place generally, I would imagine, to go where they can just be themselves and shoot the shit and just speak candidly because everyone in their circle is depending on them. Right. So you give them a place or a a person, you get to be the person that they can then depend on and let off some steam and just be real with. And I I think that that's what we all aim for. You talk about, you know, your entrepreneurship stuff. I think as an entrepreneur, I learned a long time ago that if therapy was just let's do CBT technique number 17, cognitive behavioral therapy and do cognitive dissonance discuss i'm like i couldn't do this i would i would be the one who's on the couch all the time so i i don't know about you but as an entrepreneur did did you find your own way by doing what you like or what you didn't like or how did you figure all that shit out oh who knows i'm still figuring it out <laughs> um you know i always wanted to be a therapist and i don't know why it just is something that was always intriguing to me and then you know if, of course, we go to grad school and we just learn all of the techniques, what you were just talking about. We learn about the different modalities and efficacies and yeah, all the different CBT worksheets and everything. Um, and then you, through your training program, you don't know what you're doing. I used to equate it to we're being expected to perform surgery, but we've never actually seen a surgeon do it in my grad program anyway. Um, but I would say once you venture out into the field, you know, you graduate, you get your hours, you go through supervision. At some point you, you learn what works for you, what works for your clients. You do more of that. You get more continuing education around those things. And over time, you just start to fall into what feels good for you. I always knew that when I related to people in the therapy room and didn't act like a bobblehead or like this, you know, clean slate that I was taught originally to be, when I, when I put that aside and just showed up as myself, I connected more easily with clients and their outcomes improved as opposed to when I just focus on the model and the assumptions of the model. So I think there's a lot to be said for just that. Uh, we call it the therapeutic alliance, you know, just the relationship that you have is so important and you can't have that at least a genuine one if you're not willing to show up in a more authentic way. I'm, And I think that you're absolutely right. I mean, I, you know, and by the way, I just recommend to you The Myth of Normal by Gabor Mate. 
to figure out why you're doing what you're doing. That way, after you read that book, you're going to have oh shit moments left and right. I can't wait. I'm writing it down. But um, yeah, what, write what, it down and get the pen out of my boob bag. <laughs> oh, I love the boob bag. That's cool. It says you're perfect. I don't know if you can read it, if it's backwards for you. Yeah, I can read it. Yeah. And then everyone's going to see it on YouTube. It's going to be perfect. Can't, I'm excited. All right. We, now Thank we you, got... Libby Murdoch. Shout out to my friend, Libby, therapist in Cincinnati. Now, do I have Pick to like my boot bag? Do I have to go on YouTube and tell them that I had like uh, restricted content now? Yep. Explicit. Because <laughs> the cartoon boobs. Cartoon boobs, you know, that's always dangerous. But yeah, no, I, I, I think that you're absolutely right. And I think that what, you know, one of my uh, graduate program teachers went to Stony Brook. And that's the first thing he says, like, you're not bringing CBT in the room. You're not bringing DBT to your room. You're not bringing psychoanalytic to your room. You're bringing you to your room. And never forget that. Oh, I, I really like Peter Toscano. Rest in peace, Peter. I love Peter. Uh, but I always remember that. And, you know, he, he grew up in Long Island, too. So go figure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I think it's learned. I think it, we're, in, you know, part of the other thing that I like to do is to bring who I am. And my, like, I didn't grow up, you know, I'm not saying I was poor by any stretch of the imagination, but you know, blue collar parents, parents who never graduated high school until later. And they had blue coat. My dad had a blue collar job most of his life. I think you bring that to therapy. And I think people can relate to you a lot more too. Mm -hmm. Well, and even, you know, going back to my entrepreneur roots from a business standpoint, I think it actually works to, in our favor when we bring ourselves to the therapy room, because if all I am is a, a bobblehead CBT therapist, which I'm not, no. Um, I don't really practice CBT. I'm just using that as an example, but, um, well, I do, that's a separate issue. We'll talk about that later, maybe when it comes up, but let's just say I practiced primarily CBT and you practiced primarily CBT. Well, if we live in the same town, what differentiates us from a business standpoint? If all we are is bobblehead CBT practitioners, why would someone choose to see you over me? It, it wouldn't matter. We just, therapy would become commoditized at that point. It's a race to the bottom and we're just going to go with whoever's cheapest. Right. But what makes us unique and different is that we are bringing ourselves to the room. So the way that I would hypothetically interpret CBT or any other model is going to be different from how you might interpret it slightly. Um, but bringing ourselves into it is why first responders would be more inclined to see you over me or why a budding entrepreneur would be more likely to see me over you. That makes us creative monopolies. That's what makes marketing a lot easier. It, it makes everything better and easier, both for us and our clients when we bring ourselves into the room. And, uh, and you know, all joking aside, it's going to come off as a joke, but I promise it's not a joke. It also help. like, I don't have boobs. But for some women, they need someone who's a therapist who's going to be safe that happens to be a male. Mm -hmm. And that then I go, hey, guess what? I'm not the only male in this world that's safe. And that's going to create a safe environment for you. Mm -hmm. Just had that debate with someone in the military system. Um, and I think that that's important, too, because I also know men, like some men come in for a few sessions, like, don't take this the wrong way. I need to open up to a woman. I can't open up to a man. That's fine. It's not and mm -hmm. attack me personally. You know what? Laura's down the street. She's got a good personality too. go see Laura. I think that's also important for therapists. And I think that's missing too, to say, look, maybe I'm not your cup of tea and that's okay. That's totally but, fine. But I think we don't do that enough in my opinion, because we, we sit behind the fears. Like you said, entrepreneurship, am I going to run out of clients? Am I going to run out of money? What's going to happen next? Oh, the scarcity is huge. And that, that must be a hard thing to balance as a therapist is the scarcity of just owning a business and am I going to get clients and what's going to happen when also understanding that in order for us to do our jobs well, we need to be working ourselves out of a job with our clients. So it's an interesting dichotomy maybe that therapists are having to balance is this desire to help, which means I'm working myself out of a job. I don't want you to be in therapy forever and balancing that with the scarcity of, okay, well, if, I graduate four clients this week. Those are four hours on my caseload next week that are wide open. What do I do? Well, I think it's also realizing that there's always going to be referrals. You know, I, mm -hmm. I, I joke around and it's not really a joke, but, you know, I went into private practice and one of the saddest day of my private practice is when I was full. And the reason why is that that's all I want. I want to be a therapist and I want to be full. I was full and, I, and I'm like, shit, I'm 40. I got like 
20 something years left with this crap. Yeah. Now what do I do? <laughs> right. And I, and I think that when you talk about, you know, one of the conversations you talk about entrepreneurship, what I tell a lot of therapists that I work with is, um, you know, okay, so you're afraid to be scarce. Then what's the commodity you bring to the table that's unique? And what do you have any ideas of what you want to do next? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think, I think it's a little bit of, you know, pre-interview and even in the notes, you know, you're in the middle of like, you know, two, you know, projects at this point, so to speak. Um, and that's why I tell people like for me, when I get bored, guess what? Got a podcast out of it, got a book out of it, working on a military project. Uh, I can't really go into details just yet, but I'm working with that. I'm working with the first responders on different models too. And that's all fine and good because that's what I find that is healthy to do in our field. I don't know what you think, but. Yeah. Well, I I think that everyone is a little different. So I'm, I'm hesitant to just say that the way I do it is the way it should be done. It's worked for me. It probably would work for a lot of other people, but it's not necessarily going to work for everyone. I'm a very restless entrepreneur. So like yourself, when I get bored, I need to do something else. Uh, There was a time where I was just adding more things and that in and of itself became a bit stressful. I became, um, like you got this, this light bulb moment followed by another light bulb moment. And all of a sudden all the light bulbs go out. So there was definitely some, some burnout that I dealt with a couple of years back. And I'd say that I've recovered pretty well. Um, but it, on the, on paper, it still looks like I'm doing a lot of shit. <laughs> yeah, I do. I get restless. So it's like, uh, I'll come up with a new idea or a new project and start venturing into that. And for me, it's fun. That's not the case for everyone. Some people, <clears throat> if they just want to see clients, they want to see 20, 25 clients a week for 30 years, and they feel great. Sure, do that. Just because I do it differently doesn't make it the way to do it. But I've yet to meet someone who is only a therapist and not something else yeah. uh, and is and and happy, you know, and feeling content. And I think that you talked about the scarcity, you know, the the lows of entrepreneurship as being, you know, that scarcity mentality. And that's why for me, like when I talk about, you know, you say it's not for everyone, you're right. But I remind people like, then go do something that might be scary for you. Because the great thing about being an entrepreneur in your own field is do something scary. Because worst case scenario, you drop it and you still can go back to your 25 clients a week or whatever the hell you decide. And you didn't really lose anything other than a few hours, a few days, or a few months. But I don't know. That's to me is that's what keeps me from falling the scarcity mo- mode personally. Right. Because what would happen if you got to the end of your career and now you regret not taking action on an idea you had? Because once you get an idea as an entrepreneur, it's hard to just kill it unless you try it and it doesn't work. If you just have this idea that you think, oh, that's a great idea. And then you never take action on it. It will eat away at you and consume you (laughs) if you don't do something about it. So I'd much rather try a few different things and have them fail miserably than never even try only to wonder later. Could that have been, could that have changed people's lives? And I think that that's why you do different things. And that's why, like, I, I think that being an entrepreneur in this field is one of the best gifts because psychology is everywhere. You know, I think that my clients love the fact that sometimes they can access my podcast or grab my book or what have you. And sometimes they're like, wow, you're doing too much and you're too scattered. I don't want to deal with you. And that's funny too. And that's okay. But I, I also really realized for me as a therapist, I need to have these things to look forward to because I'm not a sit still type of guy. Uh, and that's actually uh, this this new project that I'm working on. It's still in its infancy, but it is helping to support therapists who are ready to explore other avenues. There's a lot out there for therapists who want to become coaches. I feel like that's a pretty big saturated market, but not not enough people are talking about all of the different cool things that therapists can do. And you're a living example of that. I mean, being a therapist in private practice, but you also have a podcast, you've written a book, you do some consulting work. You know, it's nice to have that level of diversification, even if people look at you and think you're crazy for being what they would consider scattered. They'd be right. right. Yeah, that's true. (laughs) Um, 
But yeah, like I do a lot of things too. I like to do clinical supervision and I'm an adjunct instructor at a few different colleges and I enjoy that. It's not something that I'm doing every single day, but it just keeps, it keeps the field interesting, keeps me from getting bored. But I also think that it makes me a better therapist because I'm having to keep my finger on the pulse of new information, new data, things that are coming down the pipeline that can help my clients too. Like you said, you know, you, you know, podcasting came by accident for me. I wrote the book and then a couple of people started like, this is a great, this would be a great podcast talking about how to find your way through therapy and talk about entrepreneurship, talk about experience in therapy, fake uh, your French accent once in a while, or talk to someone from Long Island who's now a Southern <laughs> Bell or whatever. But jo all joking aside, I also tried stuff that's failed and I'm okay with that. I mean, I had a French podcast that I try because I've always like, oh, you should do it in French too, because obviously this is my first language. And I do obviously it's your first language. I mean, maybe because of where you're from, but it doesn't <laughs> sound like well, to me, French would be your first language. Make me say a TH word and we'll, you'll tell right away. But, um, you know, I tried to do the French podcast and turns out, you know, there's like, there was no market for it. And maybe I didn't market it right. Maybe I didn't have the enthusiasm maybe a combination of 17 different things. And I shut it down beginning of this year, but I don't regret trying that. And I'm okay with my failure. I learned something from that failure. And I think that that's the other part that entrepreneurs fail to realize, no pun intended, that failing is a good thing. You're going to learn something from that failure. Oh yeah. To me, failure is information. I don't even, I see it as, as completely neutral. It's not good. It's not bad. It's informative. So for you doing this French podcast and it didn't work, you got a lot of information and therefore you derived a lot of value from that. What would have happened if you didn't ever start it? It would be nagging at you. Like, well, what could this thing be? And why aren't you doing it? And um, so I think when we fail, I, I don't necessarily celebrate failure, but I definitely am not going to run away or shy from it because I think it's going to help me either way, but it's yeah. neutral. And, and I, and you, you know, you joke, you, I don't, you weren't joking around, but you talked about, you know, therapists, not, you know, we're not working out and you've had six or seven therapists, but all those quote failures taught you what you wanted out of therapy. And maybe the things that you also have to go like, wait a minute, that's not as important. Mm -hmm. Maybe, you know, it's okay if their tie is crooked or they don't wear a tie and I'm making it up here. I don't know if it was a tie that broke it for you. <laughs> but the point being is, you know, I tell, I tell myself that that's okay for those failures to, to occur so that you can learn from it. And that's okay for our clients to learn from that too. Yeah. Well, what I got from that was how I wanted to show up as a therapist. And then also as I'm coaching other clinicians who want to do private practice and as a supervisor, how I want to supervise therapists so that at, at least from a professional issues standpoint, they're showing up to sessions on time, you know, they're, they're showing that they honor their client's time. They're showing up to sessions prepared, having read their notes from the week prior, or just understanding what are the goals that we're working toward as opposed to coming to sessions unprepared. So I think I've learned the value of that from my experiences on the other side of the couch, you know? I know I've learned a lot from my therapists that I've had. I've had um, not quite seven, but probably like three over the last 10 years. And one of them was seven years. So I was with her for a long time. But I bring that experience. And, you know, even if, and I don't say anything bad about my former therapist or current therapist, but sometimes their re response was a little harsh or like, whoa. And now when I have a client who says similar things, I'm like, Hey, be careful on how you react because you learn from being on the other side of the couch that might be coming off as harsh. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I think we learn a lot from being the client. And I think that that's why like entrepreneurship for therapists, like, you know, I, I appreciate how Laura's just an amazing woman. All joke, like I've, we've joked a lot, but I love Laura because she's like, who's your audience? And, you know, she was asking me and I said, Honestly, I think it's both sides. I think therapists need to hear a little bit about it. And I think clients want to know that we're humans too. And that's what I've, one of the things I, if tomorrow something happens to me and the only thing you remember is that he was a human and he humanized therapy, I've done my job in life. Yeah, I'm you're okay good. Uh, but yeah, I think that that's the other part too that I, I really like about you, Laura, is that you're a great human. 
and you're, you know, you talk about your success, you talk about your difficulties, you make, you know, jokes and use humor. I think that that's what we tend to forget to do as a therapist. We become too so fucking self-involved sometimes yeah. that we forgot, mm -hmm. <laughs> like you're just a human. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, thank you for that. And I think that's why, like, you know, when you talk about, you know, the, the, the entrepreneurship and all that, I, you know, I always wonder how, you know, how did I succeed was pretty easy. It's like uh, I threw spaghetti against the wall and saw what stuck. And, you know, I'm a child mm -hmm. and family specialist and I hate working with children or family. Um, and not <laughs> I love because that for you. I don't, it, but it, it, it's not because of the children. It's not about the kids. Yeah. It was the parents that I couldn't stand. And yes, if you are my former client, you can do whatever the hell you want with that information. Uh, but bring it to your new therapist, I guess. Right, exactly. <laughs> but the point is, is that, you know, I think that, you know, the mindset is, it's okay to, to fail, but it's also okay to try things. But don't be content on sitting on your laurels. In my opinion, that's good yeah. entrepreneurship. I agree. I think that every great entrepreneur just tries shit. And the ones who do really well, it appears that everything they touch turned to gold and oh my gosh, um, Jeff Bezos, look at this, right? Look, look what he did. Look at all these amazing entrepreneurs who did these great things or big things or they're billionaires now. Uh, we don't often look at all the failures, do we? No. It's just that something they tried worked out and they kept doing it. So if you want to be a great entrepreneur, you too are, are tasked with having to try things. And sometimes it's not going to work. And that's totally fine. As you were saying, Steve, uh, it's information. It's okay. So what do we need to learn from that? What, how can we pivot? Uh, but I think there's a, a misconception that if someone is a great entrepreneur, it's because everything they tried worked. They had a great idea. They did it. It worked the first time. Awesome. And so then the first time we experience some sort of um, tribulation or roadblock, if we just give up and quit, then I guess we're not great entrepreneurs. And I mean, you have to push through that. But I think it's also kind of like where we need to learn to accept failure as what it is. It's failure. It's okay. Um, you know, it doesn't mean you are a failure. Correct. Just because the thing that you tried failed. Yeah. Don't, don't get your, don't derive your sense of worth and value from your projects. I love talking to my uh, soccer girls and my coach, my daughter, who's 13. I've been coaching her and my oldest for about 10 years now. This is my spring's going to be my last season, so to speak. So I'm mm -hmm. looking forward to it. One of the things I've said to the girls when we lose, I say, we have a lot more to learn from a loss than we do from a win. And I think that that's something we can translate to entrepreneurs and therapists too, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Well, you've just uh, solidified for me why we like each other so much, because I am a former soccer player. I was too, but I was lousy at it. But much better coach than I was a player. <laughs> I'm too afraid to be a coach because I think I'll uh, I'll be a screamer. I don't know. I'll, I get way into it. Uh, no, I played my entire life. I uh, played uh, into college and then ultimately burned out after my first year in college and haven't really played much since aside from, you know, pick up games here and there. Oh, well, I didn't know. Well, yeah. So soccer, so soccer was everything for most of my formative years anyway. No, I, I watch a lot of like my oldest is my, my youngest likes it, but my oldest really loves it. And we watch like women's soccer. We, you know, again, I'm not quite, I know this is going to come out later, but we watched a Canadian team play uh, another team. And my daughter knows the girls on, both teams wow. or the women, I should say. That's very vulgar of me, I think. But yes, women. vulgar. Yeah, I'm just I don't know. If someone, women. if someone's listening to your podcast and they're going to be offended by that, I think this is the wrong podcast. Well, I'll go in with a <laughs> quick joke. My my ex wife went to a woman's college, but when I was meeting her and her friends, I would always say a girl's school just to piss them off. But um, <laughs> that's, that's why the marriage didn't work. Yeah, that's that's the divorce. that was it. That's, that it wasn't that sealed the deal. So yeah, it was like girls' <laughs> school references too much. Uh, but no, I think that that soccer is life. I, I I think that I love soccer just for that. And these girls are like deriving. What I love about my girls is they support each other. And even like we have, you know, and again, not naming any girls, but some girls are not as talented as others. 
and they elevate that girl and if she makes a great effort like a oh, good job and they, they go and like i love that because you know that sometimes that's exactly what we all need and it brings that maybe when they grow up as women and just elevate other women versus sorry the feminist in me is kicking in now yeah i see uh, that i like it but you know Arr. i think that elevating women is better than like oh comparing and this she has this or who gives a shit but mm-hmm. that's just again i have white male privilege and i understand that I think you bring up an important point about attitude in entrepreneurship, because I've noticed a pretty strong link when I'm doing business coaching with a therapist who's wanting to start private practice or expand their practice or do something completely different. Maybe their practice is rocking and rolling, and now they're wanting to explore another entrepreneurial venture. I notice such a strong link with their attitude about the project and how successful they ultimately end up becoming, independent of my help. (laughs) <laughs> right. So if someone comes to a business coaching relationship and they are just tell, tell me, like, give me some ideas and I'm excited to try them. And I, I, I know I'll be successful in one way or another because I'm just gritty and scrappy. I'm going to figure it out. They are going to figure it out. But if they come to me and they're just riddled with fear about whether or not something's going to work or I want to make sure that this is the right next step, you know, every little thing they're checking in with me, is this okay? Is that okay? They're, they're timid and scared. They have a lot of uh, scarcity and um, there's a lot of perfectionism there. They can be just as successful as the first group, but man, does it take longer? Absolutely. And it comes with a lot of, uh, I think, cost to their own mental health and experience of the process of entrepreneurship. So like with your girls, you know, building each other up and understanding that when they lose a game, even a big game, there's a lot to be learned there. As you're teaching them that mentality, I would hope that that's really going to transfer into their adult lives, regardless of what career path they go down, that there'll be, they will be more willing to take risks. And I think that's ultimately what entrepreneurship is, is it's taking risks. And sometimes entrepreneurship, in my opinion, is don't worry too much, you know, get out of your head. And, mm-hmm. you know, that's a little bit I teach with my soccer girls, too, because some girls are like, OK, I'm putting my foot down through this. Day. And then by the time they finish thinking about it, the ball's gone or they, whatever happened. Mm-hmm. And it was a few girls. I'm like, stop thinking. Go with instinct. You know what you're doing. Just go with your instinct. Then they do with their instinct. Like, hey, that worked out. It's like you can't overthink everything in life. You just got to do it sometimes. And if you make uh, a mistake, yeah. all right, that's fine. We're going to, f- you know, figure it out from there. But. I don't know. That's kind of what I heard you say is that it's okay. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, okay. So you made a mistake. All right. It's not like the whole project is crumbled to death because you made a mistake. I think that's what I love so much about soccer and playing it, not to bring that analogy back, but when I was playing it, it, you have to just be in the moment. You can't plan 15 moves ahead because you have no idea what the other team's going to do. So it forces you to be very present focused Right. What am I doing with the ball right now? Where do I need to be right now? And all of a sudden it's been 90 minutes and the game's over. <laughs> you know, we're playing indoors right now because when we're recording this, we're still in it. We're still in the winter and up here in the Northeast, we got to play indoors. And I tell the girls, two touches, three touches. The third touch, it's got to be gone. You can't do more than that <laughs> because it's too small. It's a hockey. Mm-hmm. And the girls really took into that. And two touches, for those of you who don't know soccer, it means you touch the ball twice and it's gone. Or if you say three touches is two, two touches and the ball is gone. You kick it on the third one. And the girls, once they get that, they're like, wow, that really works. And I'm like, yeah, you, you, you don't have the space. It, outdoors, you have that space. Maybe you can go around. There's a lot of space, but under, like it's a hockey brick size. Yeah, it's tiny. You don't have you gotta think. You can only think one step ahead, really. Kick it off the, the boards, find a, like look up quickly, find someone open, shoot at the net, but don't overthink it. Just do it. I think that's what the best entrepreneurs do, honestly, because the times in my career where I've tried to think too many steps ahead, it really hasn't worked out well for me. There's variables I didn't consider. There's things that are going to come up. My mind changes along the way. Now I got to just like erase the whole plan and start over. But to just be more nimble, you know, think one step ahead, maybe and go from there and then pivot. It just makes it a lot easier to pivot when you're not trying to think 14 steps ahead. It's good advice for clients too, frankly. Yeah. You know, I think that that's the other part too. When you said that, I'm like, oh, I do say that to my clients. Don't overthink it. Just do it. 
you know, then we'll get to the next step after that. And if it didn't work out, we'll go look back and where did we go wrong? And we'll work together and I make it part of the team effort, even mm-hmm. within a client uh, relationship. But at least you moved. Right. Because you know, I don't want to be sitting in the same shit storm that I'm in a year from now. I at least want to be somewhere else. I'm going to break a wall here for those of you who are uncomfortable. You can um, skip for about a minute. But, you know, Laura and I were talking before the interview and saying, I don't know what we're going to talk about. I'm like, mm, just shoot the shit, see where it goes. And people, like, for some people, I've done that in interviews and you could clearly tell this is not their comfort zone whatsoever. Um, and for me, it's like, no, you just go with it. Because if we, you know, I, even my set list questions, I want you to forget you got a mic in front of you. I just want to shoot the shit with you. And so I don't, I did have questions just for the record, but I don't have a set question and I'm just going to talk to someone. And if we end up talking about soccer for 10 minutes, we talk about soccer for 10 minutes. I really don't care. Well, now we have something to talk about off, off the recording. I, I mean, it, you know, Canada and the U S teams are both in a little change right now. Uh, a couple of stars, but a lot of transitions going on there, but uh, yeah. we'll talk off the air about that. My daughter, she's only eight. She plays soccer and she's, she's fine. But, um, her love, her like thing that she absolutely is obsessed with right now is figure skating. And that is a whole new world for me. (laughs) That's something I know nothing about. Individual sport versus team sport is a whole different bag. All of, yeah. All of shit. (laughs) Yes. No shit. Uh, I played, I did do figure skating for a short while myself, actually. You did? Yes. I just pegged you as the hockey player. I hated playing hockey. Really? I And I think I someone once, one of the guys I work with told me, I don't know if this is, I don't care, it's my podcast, I do whatever I want. Um, <laughs> one, one of my, my clients said, I bet you didn't like the hockey skates because of how they fit on your foot. Your best part of a hockey game was to take off your skates. I'm like, that's absolutely true. And like, yeah, skate, figure skating skates are way different. They're not putting the same pressure on your foot. So that's probably why you like that better. Well, you just come across to me as a very dainty individual. So yeah, I can picture you doing some triple axles, like a, a uh, I never got triple to toe one. combination. At one point I had to make a choice between football and figure skating. It was football. Can you put your, your leg, you know, like how they, the really great skaters, how they can skate with their leg, like vertically up in the uh, air like that. Can you do it? Oh, that's so <laughs> there you go. My, the last time I went to PT, my PT said to me, you're like the least flexible person I ever worked with. I'm like, is that a compliment or what, <laughs> did I win anything? Did I get you're a, a challenge. <laughs> so no, I, I used to be a lot more, but I played football. I joke around that, you know, I didn't play hockey. I love football and I still love football over hockey. And that's probably why they said, leave Canada, man. You're an American. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but now I like soccer. So they probably want to send me to Europe or some shit. <laughs> I love soccer. Yeah. We'll have to talk offline sometime. I Reminisce about the good old days. I'm like the equivalent of that, you know, almost 40 year old guy who maybe played like varsity football in high school but hasn't touched it since but every time football comes up they have to talk about the big game you know the state championship i feel like that sometimes i i did, I did play soccer i was terrible at it but uh more more good like that i have that varsity football player mentality mm-hmm. I, I didn't get quite to varsity i'm a you can't see because i'm sitting down but i'm five seven and i wasn't much taller and at one point my coach says look you're not tall enough <laughs> You just can't do it, dude. Uh, you can't be an offense alignment at five three. <laughs> yeah, I would imagine not. So, but I did appreciate the the soccer analogies today because I hadn't really put those two together. You know, with like the attitude of uh, of failure and how you see a failed effort, or um, a, uh, if you lose a game four nil, it's easy to get wrapped up in that. But what you asked earlier with your girls is, well, what did we learn? And I think entrepreneurship comes, it's inherent. You're going to fail multiple times if you're doing it right. So how do you deal with the failures and the fears? How do you overcome those? I think that's really important. You know, the, we, last year we played uh, last spring, we, we got to the semifinals and we lost in a shootout and 
couple of girls that was their last town games and the last travel games that they were going to do. So a lot of them were sad and upset and some of them weren't. And some of the other younger girls were upset and it was just nice to see everyone support each other mm -hmm. and not there's, you did your best, this and that. It was just great to see it. And, you know, like people ask me why I do the soccer stuff. I'm like, honestly, if I can empower people, I'm done my job in life. And mm -hmm. those girls really like, they're starting to get my humor, which is bad because I guess it's my last season. They're finally getting me after 10 years, but. Um, <laughs> they came around eventually. So it, it's kind of fun. And, you know, and part of me is looking forward to having some free time. And part of me is going to really miss being there with those girls because I, I, I saw them grow up. So it's kind of cool. Yeah. Well, I think and that's it's the same thing as a client, right? An entrepreneur or anything you do. I think it's the same yeah. thing. It's a both and. You've got both of those that you're balancing. Well, Laura, I teach my clients that all the time. <laughs> I, I think that, you know, at one point you are going to have something to launch. And I'm going to tell you right now, you tell me the date and I will make sure that you can come on to my podcast and you can talk about whatever the hell you want. Thanks, Steve. Uh, I really enjoyed talking to you. Like I said, I, we talked on a different podcast uh, with James um, Marlin, and I truly appreciate you as a human being. I appreciate you as a therapist, what you do for entrepreneurs and as a woman and empowering other women. Again, that's all stuff that, you know, truly appreciate about you. So thank you for coming on today. Yeah. Thanks for inviting me. I know it took a while to get this set up and I really appreciate your honest efforts continuing to reach out and be like, okay, now can I get you on? So thanks for everything that you do for first responders, for people who otherwise maybe would be a bit hesitant to come to therapy and just for really making it uh, what it is. It's a human experience. So thanks for everything that you're doing through the podcast and your book and everything else that you've got going on. I got to come visit you sometime so we can shoot the shit. Well, I, I just want to see the Saturn bell out of you. Oh, wow. That accent was rough. I know. I'm the Southern Bale. I was got to touch your hair when you do it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Florida is not the South. Florida is not the South. Florida is the North, but hot and sticky. But they, they had the Southern talk. And like, re, uh, yes, but we'll, we'll get into that another time. All right. Like, let, all right let's wrap this up. <laughs> how about even if you have nothing to plug, we'll, yes. we'll, you'll come back on and we'll explain how Florida is just the North going South. Absolutely. We'll talk about it. Um, you can find me at your badass therapy practice.com. That's my uh, business coaching for therapists. And if you are located anywhere in South Carolina and you're interested in some therapy, I'd love to talk with you. So you could find me at Laura long therapy.com. Can you have any social medias that you, uh... um, I mean, through Facebook, you just, your badass therapy practice, same thing, same handle. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. I'm not on any of the others. I don't got time. I'm a mom. <laughs> I, believe me, I, I'm not a mom, but I get it. Oh, so thanks again, Steve. Please come back and um, I'll talk to you soon. All right. Bye. No, that's it for episode 142. Laura Long, thank you. Um, I hope to have you back. I know you have other projects coming up. Uh, I'll be excited to hear more about them. I don't know what they are, but I hope you come back. But episode 143 was a friend of the show, um, Liz Kelly, who has been here before. Uh, she's going to be releasing her book soon. And uh, I can't wait for you guys to hear this interview because I already like I, I just think she's going to be awesome. And I already read her book and I think it's amazing. So please join us then. Please like, subscribe and follow this podcast on your favorite platform. A glowing review is always helpful. And as a reminder, this podcast is for informational, educational and entertainment purposes only. If you're struggling with a mental health or substance abuse issue, please reach out to a professional counselor for consultation. If you are in a mental health crisis, call 988 for assistance. This number is available in the United States and Canada.